My cheating wife's lover is my next MMA opponent, so I destroyed him in the ring, kicked her out, and filed for divorce. Now she's on her knees begging for forgiveness. Seldom, if ever has a man ever found themselves in the unique circumstance I find myself in. My name is Tab Munro, and I recently found out my darling wife of three years Cassandra has been cheating on me for the better part of seven months with her ex-boyfriend Jared Iman. They have no idea I know they are sleeping with each other. But that's not the unique circumstance. The fact that I'm scheduled to fight him in a month and a half is. You see, I'm an aspiring mixed martial artist looking to break into the big leagues. I'm 26 years old with a record of 14-0-1. The one no contest was when accidentally I gouged a guy who had kicked me in the groin three times in a fight but the ref didn't call a foul. If you ask me, that fight was fixed but I digress. I fight on the local circuit here in NYC, but at this upcoming pro -um event, some of the heavy hitters of the combat sports world will be there scouting out talent to potentially give contracts to. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's start from the beginning. I met Cass four years ago when I was just starting out in the sport at an athletics convention at the JAV. That's the Jacob Javits Center for you non-New York folk. I was there helping promote my MMA gym, and Cass was there doing the same for her fitness gym, where she works as a personal trainer. To say that Cass is flawless would be an understatement. She's got the body of an Olympic swimmer while still having all of the curves a man would appreciate. Long, jet black hair down to the small of her back and these slanted, deep blue eyes. She's a spellbinding woman who turns heads at any chance, and here she was in the both across from my gyms, decked out in full gym wear literally oozing sensuality. Clearly not intended, but with a body like hers it comes with the territory. She's got it, and she knows how to flaunt it. So, the convention lasts two weeks, and it wasn't until the start of the second that I mustered the courage to start small talk with her. I mean, our booths were so close you could literally hear the conversations being had from both groups regardless. So in between trying to convince passersby to to sign up, we chit-chatted and found out we had a lot in common. As the week progressed, we'd end up going on lunch together a couple days, and a couple of the boys started egging me on to ask her out. It was pretty clear she was interested, so by that Thursday, I asked her on a date. She graciously said yes, or more specifically said it's about time, slow poke. So, that Saturday, we went out for dinner and dancing, and it pretty much followed the formula from there. After 10 months of dating, I popped the question, and she again said yes. Two months later she was my wife. And for three years we lived in what I thought was a happy marriage. I'd learned over the course of being with her that she was a huge MMA fan. And not a casual fan, either. The moment she named Dan Henderson vs. Wanderlei Silva's fight in Pride of Sea as one of her top five, I knew I had a keeper. Again, or so I thought. So, what do I know about Jared Iman? Well, I know he's the guy who came before me. Like myself, he's an aspiring fighter. Unlike me, he's a smug, pompous idiot. Think Conor McGregor and Colby Covington after doing the Dragon Ball Z fusion dance. That's the level of idiot this guy is. They were apparently college sweethearts. Both attending St. John's University, I went to NYU. From the info I gathered, he broke up with her once he thought his fight career was going to take off, which was roughly five months before Cass and I started dating. So, how does this idiot interject himself into my marriage? Turns out he reached out to her eight months ago looking to get back into her good graces. She informed him she was now married, to which he said, And I crap you not. So what? You're still my girl until I say otherwise. The part that stung the most reading that initial text chain was that she didn't even push back from it. It didn't take long for things to escalate between the two of them. Within a month of him contacting her, they were shacking up at his place. And I was completely oblivious to this as I trusted Cass implicitly. She never gave me a reason to suspect she was cheating. She never denied me affection. She never hid her phone. She never showed any of the telltale signs of cheating. So how did I find out she was cheating on me? Complete and total chance. Jared trains at what I guess you could call our rival gym. Since we're in the same area, only 8 miles apart, oftentimes fighters from his gym and my gym will compete against each other in local tournaments. One of the guys I trained with came to me one day and asked was the fitness gym Cass worked at doing some kind of cross promotion with Jared's gym, cause he always saw her car in their parking lot, and oftentimes would see her exiting the gym alongside of Jared. This guy lives only a few blocks from Jared's gym but travels the eight miles to our gym because, to be honest, our gym is just better, but I digress. I thanked him and decided to do my own investigative work the next day. That morning before she headed out to work, I asked her if she had plans after and she said she was just going hang with some of the girls, 
have a few drinks and maybe come home. Sounds simple enough. When she left, seeing as I was off from my day job that day, I decided to tail her just to quell my curiosity. She went to her gym and worked with about four clients. Around the time she had and the other trainers she works with left, she didn't go with them. Nope. She got in her car and drove five miles the other direction to Jared's gym. By this time, my stomach was in knots, but I still held out hope. Maybe there was a logical explanation for her being there. Well, I found out the explanation 23 minutes later as she walked out of the gym side by side with Jared. They proceeded to get in her car, and the moment they were situated, they did a bit of tongue wrestling before driving away. I was in too much shot to take my phone out and record or take pics of what I was seeing, but I managed to catch myself enough to start my car and tail them to their next destination, which happened to be Jared's apartment building. It was an old brownstone, and I parked a block down and watched he broken heart as my lovely wife followed Jared into the building. Maybe it's the martial artist in me, but at that moment I switched from sadness to complete indifference. It wasn't one of those scenarios where they guy laments and wonders what did I do wrong. I knew I did nothing wrong. I knew this was all her, and I knew at that moment I wanted to get even. I drove back to our apartment and began my plan to collect enough necessary evidence to nail Cass to the wall, divorce her and leave her reeling. Enter my uncle Louie, former NYPD of 30 years now moonlighting as a private investigator. The dude is a modern day Columbo. He's the first person I called when I returned home, and I laid everything on the table. He gave me his apologies for witnessing the death of my marriage, but commended me for holding it together and not doing something stupid. I didn't even have to ask him, as he said he'd stop by tomorrow and give me the rundown on a surveillance plan to get as much dirt as possible. And get dirt he did. I don't know what kind of magic Uncle Louie does or what kind of strings he can pull to get the type of access he can get. But within a month of D-Day, he provided me with mountains of evidence, including the texts I mentioned before. I pretty much had all of the evidence needed to file for divorce under the grounds of adultery, which would disqualify Cass from any spousal support. But then, a different opportunity arose. The owner of my gym brought all of us in and announced he'd signed up to have the gym represented in a major pro -um event, and he needed three fighters willing to take on fighter from Jared's gym. I jumped at the chance, and naturally when he showed us who from the other gym was willing to compete, I chose Jared as my opponent. Now I of course had to keep my reasoning under wraps, because if anyone found out they'd never let me fight him. But this coincided with my plan nicely. The next day, I met with a divorce lawyer my uncle highly recommended. I provided all of the necessary evidence, and my lawyer Mr. Greenlee said this is going to be a cut and dry case. The only question is where and when do you want her served? I gave him the date and the place. The day of the event, at the venue it was taking place. In a month and a half, he instructed me over the next month to get my ducks in a row, separate any joint accounts and decide what shared assets if any I'd want. He also said to be prepared for if she decided to fight the divorce, to which I told him I could guarantee she wouldn't. So cue the night of the fight. I'd spent the last five weeks training, and when I wasn't training or working my day job, I was doing as Mr. Greenlee said. The night of the fight, I knew Cass would be in attendance. She always attended my fights. I didn't however, tell her who my opponent was, and I'd learned through texts and call logs that though she told Jared she was married, she never told him who she was married to, so he had no idea he was about to step in the cage with her STBXH. You'd figure the hour leading up to the fight I'd be a ball of nerves, but it was actually the calmest I'd ever been before a fight. This chilling sense of purpose washed over me to the point where even my team were taken aback at how calm I was. Normally I like to get myself amped up, but not tonight. I knew I was taking a huge risk, but it was a risk I was willing to take. When the knock on the door happened that I was up, I stood up without uttering a word and followed my coach and trainers out of the locker room. Jared was announced first and he did his walk out to the cage. From the gorilla position I had a good view of where Cass was sitting, and what she did pretty much sealed the deal blowing the idiot a kiss as he did the gun signs her direction. So he's in the cage doing his warm-ups, and they announce my name as his opponent. What happened next is one of the most priceless moments I'll ever remember. Cass went completely pale, the look of pure dread on her face evident. As I followed my team out to the cage, she held her hands to her mouth in shock having had no idea I'd be Jared's opponent. As we walked with her proximity in the stands, I just glanced her direction with what could best be described as a death stare. I think it was at that moment, that one look I gave her told her everything about how this night was going to end. The bell rings and the fight starts. As I expected, Jared comes out guns blazing. 
I knew from studying film on him he's a fast starter and likes to overwhelm his opponents with lots of strikes. Physically, Jared and I were almost identical in stats. About the same height, same weight and I had a 2 inches reach advantage. What differed between us is skill sets. Jared was a brawler who relied on shock and all. Whereas I'm what you'd call a classic point fighter, measuring distance and timing to land a strike at the perfect moment. Also differing between us was our grappling. Jared had some wrestling skill from his days at SJU, as did I from NYU. But I was also a BBJ purple belt. To my knowledge, Jared had no formal BJJ rank. So after a good two minutes of Jared trying to overwhelm me, I key on to the fact that he likes to load his left foot on the backside before throwing his hook. I waited for him to set it up again, and stepped through with my right foot to get ahead of his punch, before his shoulder even turned. Bang, I hit him flush with a shot to the rib. There's two types of sounds a shot like that makes, the load, slapping sound that gets the crowd amped because it sounds brutal, or the funk sound that's only heard by the three people in the ring, but felt by the guy getting hit. The later is what you want, cause that means the impact went deep into the muscle tissue. Those shots hurt, and sure enough Jared jumped back like he'd been stabbed and did his best to act as if it didn't hurt. But the grimace on his face, and on the ref's face, told me another story. So for the rest of the first round, we have a couple exchanges of flurries, but the initial tidal wave Jared tried to crash on me got stopped with that body shot. The round ends and I glance over Cass' direction. Surprisingly, she's still in the stands with a look for fear and concern on her face. I wasn't sure what it was about, me getting hurt, Jared getting hurt, me knowing about her affair with him. All I knew is was she was glued to her seat, which is just what I wanted. In my corner, my coach praises me for the body shot and tells me he wants more of the same in the next round. As I look across the cage at Jared I could see him trying to figure me out, wondering why he couldn't get a beat on my emotions. It was like he was staring at some sort of specter. The bell sounds and round two begins. This time, Jared's not as aggressive, but it didn't matter. He comes at me trying to set something up with his jab, pawing at me with his right, then plants that back left foot again for his right hook. He clearly didn't learn his lesson the first time, as I time it and this time step back on my left so his hook hits nothing but air. Before he can reset his stand I step forward on my right foot again, swing my left hip and crack him with a left body kick on the same side I hit him in the ribs in round one. Again, the shot sunk deep into the sinew, leaving a bright red welt on his side. This time, the crowd let out a collective ooh as the shot left Jared up on his tiptoes before he retreated back a few steps. Under normal circumstances I'd pounce when my opponent is hurt. Not this time, I wanted to savor this. It was after this shot that I figured Jared realized this wasn't a normal fight. I could see the confusion in his eyes as if to say who the F is this guy. I just stood in my stance, taking a slight moment to glance over in cast direction. When her eyes met mine I could see genuine fear in them. Jared glanced over slightly to see the same thing, and I think that's the moment it dawned on him who I was, and what he was locked in this cage for two more rounds with. His demeanor completely changed. Whereas in round one he came out guns blazing looking for the slaughter, he suddenly realized he was the gazel, and I was the tiger toying with its meal. Jared stepped in to try and score a 2-2-1 combo, but I stepped to the side of the third shot and delivered a 3. That's a right hook BTW, that wobbled him. The only thing that kept him standing was the cage. Even the ref realized at this point I wasn't trying to win, I was trying to make an example of him. As again I didn't follow up. I just stood in my stance and waited for Jared's next advance. The ref took a moment to allow Jared to reset, and gave me a reprimand to keep the action going. I simply nodded, got my guard back up and waited for the ref to tell us to an inch. When he did, I guess it was either pride or embarrassment that spurned Jared's next move. He threw a 1-2 to two to close distance, and initiated an over-under clinch when he got close. As we jostled for position he said to me dude, what's your problem? I didn't answer back, I simply pummeled out from his over-under into a body lock, popped my hips and delivered a suplex that would have made my old wrestling coach bust a nut. All I saw was elbows and feet go sailing over my head before hearing the sound of Jared's body hit the mat with a thud. Thankfully for him, the bell sounded and round 2 came to an end. Jared scrambled back to his corner, and I could see him talking to his trainers and coach with a look of dread on his face. Meanwhile in my corner, my coach is in my grill screaming about not showing off. Next time you get him reeling, finish the effing fight. What are you doing, Tab? I look my coach in the eye and simple utter the words to him that idiot is effing my wife. There was a lot of dread in that arena, because my coach took a step back and said oh crap. 
Are you effing serious? I just look forward in Jared's direction with a look of stone-cold stoicism in my face, devoid of emotion. This time I didn't even bother looking toward Cass. This was going to be where I send my message. The bell for round three sounds, and we both take the center of the cage. Bruce Lee is widely considered the godfather of MMA, on the account that the style he pioneered Jeet Kune Do the way of the intercepting fist uses the same principles of MMA. Take what works for you, discard what doesn't, make it uniquely your own. It gets its name from using offense as defense. When a punch is thrown at you, instinct tells you to defend. To block, in JKD, you're trained to do the opposite. You literally beat their punch. To the punch, with a punch, or a kick, or an eye gouge, or anything that's going to stop them in their tracks. If this was a street fight, I could have been creative. But this was a sanctioned fight, so I had to keep it legal. Jared started off trying to land a leg kick, but I checked it and returned fire with one of my own towards the leg he chambered from. Hit him on the inside on the leg right on the tendon. Those craps hurt like a tramp. He immediately stepped back and switched stance to protect that leg. He tried to step forward with jab, straight combo, but I parried the jab like it was leaf falling from a tree that met his left straight with my right elbow. It's an unorthodox way of blocking a strike perfected in the US penitentiary system in a fighting style called 52 blocks. It can break the hand of the guy throwing the punch. Jared let out an audible yelp when his knuckles met the point of my right elbow. There's a moment in a fight when you witness the will of your opponent fade. They emotionally concede defeat before the physical defeat happens. After that parry, that's what I saw in Jared's eyes. It was time to end our dance. Jared loaded off his back right foot this time, and chambered his left leg for a high kick. He was trying to swing for the fences as he clearly realized he was losing on points, and I clearly outclassed him in skill. I ducked his high kick while shifting to my left foot upon standing up. I transferred that shift to my hips and whipped back around with a picture-perfect right hook gut that landed with a thud. I could feel the impact reverberate to through my forearms it landed so hard. Jared crumbled like stale cookie to his knee as he backed into the cage. I'd already got a warning from the ref about not following up, so this time as Jared reeled to try and catch his breath, I charged in with a full body tackle, pinning him to the cage, getting a good body look on him again. Pinning his elbows to his ribs in my grip, I scoop him off of his knee and with every ounces of strength in me, lift him clean off of his feet and body slam him into the mat. Not a moment after, I move to side control and sink a Darce choke in on him. The Darce choke is one of the most brutal submission holds in the sport. It's called a blood choke, as it reaches its effect from cutting off blood flow to the brain. If held too long, it can slaughter a man. It also happens to be my favorite submission move. Within 5 seconds, Jared was out like a light, and the ref scrambled to get me to release it. It took all of the fortitude in my soul not to choke the life out of this man, but I'd done what I set out to do. I reclaimed my manhood by making an example of this pompous sass hat. As the ring announcer announced me as the victor, and the ref raised my hand, my team entered the cage and celebrated. But I wasn't in a celebratory mood. Cass had made her way to the cage at this point. Under normal circumstances she'd be all over me, showering me with kisses. But this time, she entered with a somber, timid and unsure look on her face. She first looked over to Jared as the medics tended to him, then to me with the most sorrowful look I've ever seen on a human being. It looked as if she was going to walk towards me, but before she could get close I motioned for for someone else to enter the cage. Good all Uncle Louie. In his hand was a manila folder. He stood between Cass and I, looked her dead in the eyes and said in a clear and bold voice Cassandra Munro, you've been served this petition for divorce on the grounds of adultery. He handed my now dumbfounded STBXW the folder, pulled out his phone to take a pic denoting she'd been served, turned to me and said good fight, kid. Call me when you get home. With that he left the cage. Cass was left stunned, looking at the folder in her hand, then back up at me. It looked as if she wanted to say something, but her bottom lip was quivering and she couldn't utter a word. I didn't even bother to look and see what happened next. I just walked past her and out of the cage. My team followed me not soon after. As I said, seldom does a man get the opportunity to legally put hands on the man his wife is cheating on him with. It's a chance I couldn't resist. Unexpected to me was how much better a fighter I was compared to him, but I was still left with the lingering feeling of why Cass chose to ruin whatever future we had for this guy. Little did I know that night. The fight was far from over. Update. Back in the locker room, I had to come clean with my team about what had happened. For so many months I kept it secret the motivations of agreeing to fight the douche back. And when I finally revealed it, the reaction was a mixed bag. 
My training partners and cutmen were all elated, but my coaches, they weren't pleased, especially my head coach and owner of the gym I train at, Jegard. He chewed me out over what this could potentially do to the gym should it come to light. How this was basically sanctioned assault and battery and had the city athletic board got wind of it. He could lose his license for allowing me to fight this guy and I could end up in jail. I honestly didn't think that far ahead. After almost an hour of pleading with him, I convinced him that I'd handle it and it'd have no blowback on the gym. He reluctantly told me okay but mandated that I'd not be taking another fight until after all of the crap storm of my divorce was settled. This came as a bit of a blow, as sure enough a lot of the scouts in the crowd were in awe of my performance, and I'd learned just days later from Jegard's brother Ansar, who manages the books of the gym, told me I had four contract offers on the table, two of them from the big boys of the MMA industry. He did his due diligence to let them know I was going through personal matters, but we'd speak with them as soon as thing had settled. But I'm getting ahead of myself a bit. The ride home is where it really hit me. The adrenaline of the fight faded, and my entire body felt 1,000 seconds of pounds heavier. The creeping dread of what was to become the next chapter of my life grabbed me by the throat. I had to pull over to the side of the road, to a spot dark enough that no one would see me and let it all out. Then I did. All of the months of festering rage. Everything that I couldn't unleash on Jared or Cass skulls. I roared. I cursed. I cried. I think it was a full-on emotional breakdown. I wouldn't know, because I'd never had one before. But it all sank in. The reality was that my marriage was over. The Cass, who had meant so much to me, that had served as my motivation and drive to better myself as a man, and as a fighter, had betrayed me in the worst way a woman can betray a man. I remember what Uncle Louis said before he left the cage, and I needed to hear a reassuring voice, so I called him. He picked up on the first ring and immediately asked where are you, Tab. You alright? I swung by your complex an hour ago when you weren't there called Jegard and he said you left the event center by yourself. I hadn't even realized three hours had passed since I left. I reassured him I was okay, pulled over on a side street three miles from my apartment lamenting the destruction of my marriage. Uncle Louis gave me sage advice as only he could, and all warned me that when he passed by, he saw Cass' car in her parking spot, which meant she was home. I thanked him for all of his help and his words of wisdom, and told him I'd text him when I was home. Sure enough, when I pulled into my parking space, Cass' car was sitting in hers. Did she come straight home after the fight? Did she spend time with Jared before doing so? Those are just some of the thoughts boiling in my head as I made my way to the apartment. As I reached the door, I could hear two voices behind the door, both females. One was unmistakably Cass, the other I could only assume was her best friend and co-work, Josefina. Josie for short. Part of me wanted to turn around and just go, but that part lost as badly as Jared did earlier. This was my apartment. It had been mine since before Cass and I even started dating. If anyone was getting out, it was her. The voices on the other side of the door hushed as my keys jingled opening the door. When I stepped in, a chill shot down my spine as Cass and Josie were sitting on the couch. Cass couldn't even bring herself to look me in the eye, but Josie did. In a voice that almost sounded like a whisper Josie spoke, breaking the silence. Tab, please. Cass effed up. She knows she did. There's no excuse for it, but divorce. So suddenly, without even giving her a chance to explain, I cut her attempt at asking more questions with one of my own. One that broke down whatever potential defenses she may have had. Did you know? She stammered in her response saying huh, coining a phrase my dear all grandpa would say when I feigned ignorance with that reply I retorted sternly if you can huh you can hear, did you know? Cass light sobs grew louder as I raised my voice, which pretty much gave me the answer. Cass and Josie have been friends long before I was in the picture, most like since back when Cass was dating Jared. So of course, she'd be complicit in Cass' infidelity. I stared daggers into Josie, and not long after she too couldn't meet my gaze. I dunno, I guess she sensed things slipping further out of her control, because it'd be Cass to speak up next. Tab, please. I made a horrible mistake. I let my emotions get the better of me, and old feelings for Jared that I never dealt with from how we broke up came back when he reached out to me. I cut her off immediately by saying a mistake. A mistake is accidentally picking up a coffee mug on the side and not by the handle when it's got hot liquid in it. A mistake is going to the market to buy food, getting to check out and realizing you left your wallet at home. Wanna know what's not a mistake? Going behind your husband's back and effing your ex-boyfriend, who if I recall broke up with you when he thought he was about to hit the big time. For eight effing months, by the end of my statement, she not only realized the gravity of the situation, but exactly how much I knew. If she had intent to try the it only happened once play, it got knocked out worse than Jared did. 
This time her sobs were inconsolable. The type of ugly cry you make when your impending doom is set in stone. Josie tried to chime in saying Tab, you know she loves you and only you. Please, you can get through this. Just give her a chance. She'll make it up to you. We'll make it up to you. I know it was wrong, but she's like a sister to me. And I know what Jared did to her firsthand. She needed to get him out of her system. Cass added you were never supposed to know. I never meant to hurt you. I just wanted to give Jared a taste of what he walked away from. Then flaunt you in front of him to make him regret breaking my heart. I cut her off again. So what? You're still my girl until I say otherwise the deer in headlights look in her eyes revealed even deeper how far in the hole she dug herself she was. I continued. So, you had an eight month affair with the guy who broke your heart and dumped you because thought he was going to move to greener pastures, lying to me in the process, out of sick need for revenge. Sweetie, you need mental help. No human being in their right sense of mind does that unless they are out of their damned mind. I thought I knew you, Cass. Clearly, I was dead wrong. As dead wrong as you are thinking there is any way we can get through this, or that I'll ever forgive you. By this point, both women had tears in their eyes. If their plan was to tag team me into slowing down or cancelling the divorce, it failed categorically. Baby, please. I don't want a divorce. I love you. Please. Don't do this. Don't end what we have because of my stupidity. I'll go get counseling. I'll delete my social media. I'll give you access to everything. I'll wear one of those GPS ankle bracelets inmates do so you always know where I am. Please baby, don't throw me away. Cass was on her knees now, groveling for forgiveness. Hours ago, this sight would have broken me. But indifference is all I felt for her. They say the true opposite of love is indifference, and every iota of love I had for her vanished. I replied Cassadra, you threw us away the moment you entertained the attention of another man, let alone that man. You had an eight-month affair with him thanks to your own vanity and sickening need for validation and revenge. We have nothing more to say without lawyers present. So get off your knees, go into my bedroom, pack up whatever crap you need and get out. Those words made Josie jump out of her chair and shout you can't just kick her out. She lives here too. I looked to her and retorted this apartment is in my name. It's been mine since before I met your traitorous friend. And she's now unwelcomed here. So she can either leave on her own or I can get NYPD involved. Normally this kind of tactic ends disastrously for men. But it's literally my apartment. Cass' name wasn't even on the lease. I'd convinced her it wasn't necessary since by the time the lease was up, we'd be in the process of moving into a bigger place. Since starting a family was at point on the cards. Obviously, things have changed. Sobbing, Cass and Josie stood up and headed towards my bedroom. I followed soon after and stood in the doorway as they both loaded her suitcases with as much as they could fit, which wasn't nearly enough. I'd say almost 70% of our collective closet and draw space was cast stuff. She'd clearly need multiple trips to get all of her crap. When I saw they were nearing completion of the task, I headed back into the kitchen, grabbed me a bottle of water and sat at the island. Sniffling and sobbing still, I watched as they dragged three large suitcases behind them as they headed for the door. As she passed me, in a meek and timid voice, Cass muttered the words I'm sorry, Tab. I'll make this up to you. I simply responded with one word, lawyer, and took another sip of my water. She burst into tears again and they hurried out of the door. I got up, closed and locked the door behind them. I let out a deep sigh as I text Uncle Louie a short message, I'm home. She's gone. He immediately responded texting back get some rest, tab. No alcohol. I'll swing by in the morning. I crashed on the couch that night. I know they'd never made it to the point where they'd attempt effing in my bed, but the energy of the room still radiated Cassandra. There were barely aspects in this apartment I'd called home the last six years that didn't have her signature on it. Married guys know how it is. Your girl moves in and the space that was once your bachelor pad becomes her canvas. She does everything and everything to erase the fact that you were once single from it. And we men let it happen. It's like a rite of passage for young married couples. It's kind of symbolic that the couch was one of the last vestiges of my life before cast that remained. It belonged to my dearly departed father, who died when I was four. He, like Uncle Louie, was NYPD. He was gunned down in a robbery attempt in Red Hook, Brooklyn. Saved the lives of eight people. My dad wasn't a high-profile detective. He was a simple beat cop. But that night he took out four gangbangers trying to rob a bodega. There were five of them. He never saw the last one from what I'm told. The couch holds significance to me because, well, I was born on this couch. My mom never got rid of it, especially after his passing. And when I moved out on my own, she gave it to me, as it's one of the last existing mementos of him. I slept like a baby. Whatever anxiety, pain and anger existed in me it seemed got let out in my outburst on the side of the road. Tomorrow was going to be a busy day indeed.
the day I officially begin the process of erasing Cass from my life. But there was still an issue I knew was going to need clearing up. The fallout of the fight with Jared Imon. And yes, it ended up being exactly the kind of crap show you would have expected. Thank you so much for watching till the end. If you really like our videos, then don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Have a good day.